the first question is what is the diff what are the differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes can you see this uh, white screen whiteboard hello yes we can see it okay so difference between pro and um, eukaryotes so uh, one of the major the major the most important the main difference between the prokaryote and eukaryote is is that prokaryotes no nucleus no nucleus in the in the uh, prokaryotes and in eukaryotes there are a eukaryotic cell has um, it has nucleus is present come if you if you look at the human cells in human cells uh, uh, there is no cell wall but bacterial cells they have cell wall but human cells they they don't have no cell wall no cell wall in human cells uh, the third difference that i would uh, i would incorporate is that uh, that the dna uh, bacterial dna uh, is is uh, is is covered with histone histone proteins. Bacterial DNA is not is not uh, complexed with histone proteins. Uh, in contrast, the eukaryotic cells, uh, the DNA is is packaged or complexed with histone proteins histone proteins so I'll, I'll so these histone so you so you remember that histone proteins um, so those who those who join now i just started i'm at the first question so dna is packaged in eukaryotic cells as 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 chromosomes and the proteins that pack, packages the DNA, package the DNA is called as histone proteins. So just to revise, nucleus is present in eukary eukaryote in contrast to prokaryotes which don't have nucleus. Uh, there are no cell walls in human cells, but bacterial bacteria, they have cell wall and bacterial DNA is not packaged with histones. It is loose. It is it is diffused floating cytosol of bacterial cell, but in eukaryotes because a nucleus is present, uh, that so it is compartmentalized in a special home called as nucleus, and there DNA is packaged with a special protein called as histone proteins. That packaging helps a six meter long DNA of human body, of in human cell to be you know to be you know to be restored or stored in a small space called as nucleus okay so this was number first let's go to um, question number second so the next question is what are the differences between a plant cell and an animal cell so this is uh, quite straightforward uh, so a plant cell plant cell has a has you know chloroplast the chloroplast has pigment called as chlorophyll that can chlorophyll 
that can harness uh, solar energy. And that's why uh, so with the help of solar energy, plants can produce their own uh, glucose. And so that's why the plants are called as primary producers. So this is the, uh, the, the typical, um, typical uh, characteristic of plants. They're a primary producer, that's because they have chloroplast and chloroplast, they have pigment chlorophyll that can get activated by uh, sunlight and there's a biochemical process which can convert carbon dioxide and water with, sun, with solar energy into the glucose. Now, in contrast, animal cells, in contrast, animal cells, and animal cells, they don't have chloroplast, uh, no chloroplast. And, or let's say in, in animal, let's consider humans as a model. So we, our, our cells there, we don't have chloroplast. Our cells also has no cell wall. Uh, and in plants, because plants are in direct touch with the environment, uh, plant cells, they have cell wall. And uh, so human cells, they don't have cell wall. So the only uh, extra thing that a, a human cell has, boundary, is called as cell membrane. And some books will call the cell membrane as a plasma membrane. Uh, also, uh, plant cells, they have, because plant, you know, leaves, they are in direct touch with the environment. So, uh, and uh, if, there, if it is very hot uh, in deep summertime, so plants also lose water, hydrate, uh, they get dehydrated. So to, to to circumvent, to overcome the dehydration process, uh, to maintain plants, uh, you know, cellular, uh, you know, osmolarity, uh, os, uh, you know, uh, molarity, or, or or to maintain the turgidity of cells, plants have very large vacuoles. And these vacuoles they contain uh, fluids that that protects a uh, plant, you know. Uh, during excessive heat, right? So they have large vacuoles, plants. In, in contrast, human cells, they don't, they have, uh, or eukaryotic cells, they have very, very small vacuoles. And these small vacuoles in, in, in eukaryotes, they are mainly used to, to, to release um, waste material. Waste um, material, materials. So these are, main, uh, these are major differences between, there could be more, but I don't want to go into the details. So plant cells, chloroplast present, animal cell absent. Animal cells have no, or eukaryotic cells, or human cell, they don't have cell wall, but plants have cell wall. Large vacuoles are present in plants to, to maintain the osmolarity of the cells, whereas in, 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 in humans or, or in eukaryotic cells, there could be small vacuoles that is used to, to transport waste material out of the cells uh, upon digestion. It is vacuoles are more prominent in unicellular eukaryotes like algae. They don't have a well-formed digestive system as human beings. So these vacuoles, if they contain digestive enzymes, they're called as lysosomes. And if they're using, uh, to, 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 if they're being used to just transport waste material, so it could be a vacuole. This was second question. Uh, let's go to the third uh, question. The third question is, what are the similarities between 
the bacterial cell and a plant cell. So the similarity between a bacterial cell and a plant cell is that, uh, first of all, similarity, we are talking of sim sim similarity. So both plant cells and bacterial cells, they both have cell walls. Why they have cell walls? They have cell walls because uh, they need, they are in touch with, so if we feel cold, human beings, we rush into our home. We could turn on the heater. If we, feel, if we feel heat, summer, we turn on the AC. But plants and bacteria, they are in open space, open environment. So evolutionarily, they have developed cell walls, which would protect them, not only from environment, but other attacks, like you know, uh, from, from bacteria, from other pathogens. From, in case of bacteria, it could be bacteriophages. So that's some major similarity between, between the plant and bacteria. And also some bacteria, like cyanobacteria, they also have pigments, like plants have chloroplast, chloroplast has chlorophyll. Some bacteria have pigments. Those bacteria are uh, generally called as cyanobacteria. So they have also pigments. So, so these are some of the similarities between uh, Plant, a plant cell and a bacterial cell. So uh, the fourth question is, uh, what are the similarities between an uh, animal cell and a bacterial cell? So similarities. So between an animal cell and a bacterial cell, I would say, um, and this could be true for all cells, um, one is they all have DNA material as DNA. Uh, second, uh, between uh, they both have a cell membrane. Although the animal cell or human cell in particular, it don't the uh, human cells they don't have cell wall. They both of them have so all plant cell, uh, animal cell, bacterial cell they have ribosomes, right? Um, and uh, so these are the major similarity between uh, plant cell, human cell, and a bacterial cell. So um, what are the functions of these organelles below? So nucleus, so nucleus is an organelle uh, that stores so nucleus is a organelle that stores the genetic material and it is it is separated from cytoplasm because with uh, by a, a a membrane called as nucleus membrane and also a nucleus has a nucleolus and we will learn later that in nucleus, um, DNA replication and transcription occurs. And nucleus is a characteristic of uh, eukaryotes. So it is present in both plant and animal cells. Nucleus is not present in prokaryotes, including bacteria. Okay. So nucleoid. In, 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 in bacteria, there are, in bacteria, there is no, uh, no uh, well-formed uh, nucleus. In bacteria, no well-formed uh, well nucleus in, in bacteria. And because of which bacterial chromosomes, um, bacterial chromosomes are, are, um, are, are diffused in the cytosol, are, are, are diffused in the cytosol. So now what is the function of ribosomes? 
ribosomes are the primary sites for protein synthesis. And what I would like to remind the class is that uh, protein, so this is a, I use the word primary, but there are some other organelles where uh, uh, protein uh, synthesis or protein transport occurs, and those are rough endoplasmic reticulum where protein transport occurs, and protein uh, modifications also occurs in Golgi apparatus. But the primary site of protein synthesis is is and what is the function of mitochondria? Mitochondria, it functions, the main function of, of mitochondria is to generate ATP. And again, um, Golgi apparatus, it helps in, it helps, Golgi apparatus helps in the, in the, in the secretion of proteins outside the cell. What is outside the cell called as? It is called as extracellular environment. And what are those proteins that could that are secreted into extracellular in environment? Hormones. So in, in our in our uh, brain area there is a uh, endocrine endocrine gland called as pituitary and they release many hormones that travel through blood to distinct organs uh, for example if it's if it senses uh, differences in sugar presence in our body it tells the the pancreas the beta cells of the pancreas to release insulin and if this pathway or something is wrong with pancreas and it cannot sense in the presence of sugar, then it leads to the, uh, to the development of diabetes. So it's Golgi apparatus is important for, for protein secretion. Not all proteins are secreted. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, it helps in transport of proteins. And uh, uh, <clears throat> and th those are called as rough ER. And the other kind of ER is smooth ER that helps in lipid biosynthesis. Now the question comes: uh, Why 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 are, are endoplasmic reticulum becomes rough? It's it's rough because these uh, Rough ERs, rough ERs, they contain ribosome on their surface. So that's why the presence of ribosomes on endoplasmic reticulum make them like small blob-like structure on their membrane, and that makes them rough. And they are mainly responsible for protein transport. Uh, what, uh, what, what is the function of lipos, uh, lysosome? Lysosome, uh, they contain uh, digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes, um, especially in, in, in the unicellular, uh, unicellular uh, eukaryotes. And these digestive enzymes, they uh, because think about uh, algae, which is floating in the water, in a pond, in a stationary pond, they will take the food, and it's a single cell. The food travels inside the body, inside the cytos cytosol, and then it is digested by these lysosomes, and then the waste product of nutrition is then thrown out with the help of vacuoles. Question number six. Uh, sorry, question number fifth, why a lipid molecule is described as amphipathic? Because this is a unique molecule uh, that has polar head and non-polar tail. So, uh, so let me show you. 
Why it is called as antipathic? Because lipids have, in a single molecule, lipids have a polar head and a non-polar non -polar So this is head, uh, the globular shape, shape, the spherical shape, and these are the tails. So the head is head is um, head is polar, or you can say charged, and the charge could be positive um, and negative, or either, and uh, and they are hydro. So you have to think with com so common example is you know one of the most important characteristic of this virus COVID-19 is its lipid structure, its membrane structure, and it is good that it is made up of lipids. So lipids are what fat. So you know they are recommending 20 seconds of hand wash. If you hand wash with a detergent, detergent. So detergent, so lipids mean what? Lipid means oil or butter. So if you dip your finger in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a oil or lipid or fat or butter, you know, it becomes greasy and it's, it cannot take, go off by simple washing with water. We have to use soap. So soap can take out, uh, can take out uh, fats or greasy things from our, on our hand so because they can wash away the lipids so, so this these this virus is also has a unique lipids in their in their structure and so detergents are very powerful in in wiping up these virus if they if it is on our hand or on its or any surface and just 20 seconds is more than enough to to obliterate or destroy this virus so head now what is a tail so tail is so tail is is non-polar. Non-polar means non-charged. It is hydro. It is hydrophobic. Means it doesn't like water. So it's a uni a lipid molecule is a unique molecule. Hydrophilic head. Uh, sorry for this typo. Hydrophilic head and uh, hydrophobic tail. Polar head, non-polar tail. So this ambiguity is is called as ampipathic. Remember, there's a there's a group of animals like that that come under a phylum called as amphibians. Amphibians. Amphibia is made up of two words. Amphi. So the example is, example is frog. Frogs are the example. So, what is the what are the character what is the characteristic of frogs? Um, that it could live in water, and it can it can live in, on land also. So, dual characteristic. So, lipids are called as amphipathic. Ampi, amphi, amphi. Means it also has amphi word means dual characteristic. And what is the dual characteristic? Is that polar? Head, non-polar tail, hydrophilic head, hydrophobic tail. So lipid molecules are, are, are amphipathic molecules. And that's the reason, biochemical reason. How the lipid molecules are arranged in a membrane? So um, I mentioned, showed this on the slide in my record, that lipids on, in a membrane are present in two layers layers. Membrane is what? Membrane is a boundary between the cytosol and the membrane is a membrane is the boundary between the cytoplasm and the outside world or outside environment. So it is made up of two layers of lipids. Uh, lipids and called as bilipid there. And what happens here? 
the head of the lipid, head of the, of the lipid molecule, molecules, they face inside or outside and the, the tails, the hydrophobic tails, they face each other. They face each other. Let me open one slide to show you what exactly I mean here. One second. So these are, uh, these are some of the examples of, so let's pick up this. So what you see, head and tail, and they are in the membrane, they are arranged as two layers, heads facing outside and inside, and the tails are facing each other. And so look at the, the blue colored lipid molecule with the, the blue colored tail, you see a lot of kink there. These kink are because of double bond. I don't want to go into details. The double bond makes a lipid unsaturated. And lipid molecules are arranged in a membrane, in our membrane as bilayers. So, so these are beautiful pictures. They're arranged as bilipid layers. So that's the answer to this question. So let's go to the next question. Draw the structure of typical chromosome. So a typical chromosome, so remember one thing, uh, I always tell my class that we all learn or that we have 46, human cell has 46 chromosomes, right? But actually it is, 23 pairs. So we, how does 46 happens? Because 23 comes from father and 23 comes from mother and they fertilize so that we have 46 chromosomes. But they're not, they're not, uh, they're not uh, 46 different, they are pairs. 23 from father, 23 from mother. So it is actually two, it's called as two N because it is two sets of, two sets of 23 chromosomes. So it becomes 23 pairs. A typical many books, so students, so that, that's the reason, you know, I am paying in, in giving so much info, in, emphasis on this chapter. So many students, um, they think that that chromosomes look like this, but actually chromosomes are like this. A central piece, a central piece is called as, to which all the chromosomes attach, uh, to central piece to all uh, the chromosomes attach, is called as centromere central part. So this is attached chromatid. So this is, uh, this is, uh, this is one chromatid and this is another chromatid. Right? So these are, this is one chromosome, right? Central centromere and centromere is attached to chromatids. Now what happens when the chromosomes duplicate or when the DNA replicates, the chromosome becomes like this. And what's the relationship between the, these two chromosomes? They are, they are sister chromatids because they are actually originating from the pre-existing chromosome. So most students will think that the real chromosome exists like this. No, the real chromosome is actually like this. It's only when the chromosome duplicates, it becomes like this. So a typical chromosome is made up of a, chrom of a centromere and to this centromere is attached chromatids. Okay. So um, 
we took care of question number eight. Now, what are the importance of cell division, whether it is bacteria or it is human cell or plant cell? What is the importance of cell division? So the importance of cell division is one, every living organism wants to grow in numbers. Second, in terms of human beings, growth is associated with development. That's how our journey start. We, we are formed inside our mother's body when uh, male gamete and female gametes, they fuse, they form zygote on day one and then our journey starts. So if cell division doesn't occur, an infant, a baby will not grow. So development is important. Cell division is important part of the development of multicellular organism, such as humans. Third is differentiation. Why differentiation? Because think about it, if cells don't grow, they don't develop, uh, it won't differentiate into brain, intestine, liver. So our body is an assembly of very specialized organs. It is very unique. That a single, it's very unique. Remember, this is, this is a question which scientists, they don't still understand. How a single cell, how a single cell called as zygote, how a single cell called as zygote, the single cell, right? How does, how, what are the capabilities of a single individual, right? There must be some programming. Some, some programming inside the zygote that affect the, the total uh, un, unraveling of human body. So what is essential to the growth of zygote? Cell division, then development. After five to six days, our, our body starts developing into different directions. They form different layers that, that, that determines the cell fates or fate of different organs, brain, kidney, lungs. So very interesting uh, uh, aspect of biology, human development. So that's the reason, what's, that's the importance for cell division. Uh, what are the differences between uh, a somatic cells and a, and a germ cells? So a somatic cells, uh, a somatic cell, um, a somatic cell will, somatic cell will, somatic cell will give rise to all organs except, except the gametes, the gametes, somatic cells, from hair follicles to taste birds to digestive cells that digest our food, to kidney cells that filtrates our waste material, urine. So from, from all, all the cells of the body, except those cells that form gametes, they are present in germ cells. So germ cells are those dedicated cells that only give rise to gametes. And what is the process? Uh, between uh, what is a process that that helps the germ cell to become gametes? That process is called as meiosis. A meiosis is that process which helps the germ cells to to develop or generate gametes. So slowly, slowly, we are going towards more intricate details of cell division. So what is, what are, what is the difference between a haploid cell? What is the difference between a haploid cell and a diploid cell? So, so cells, cells which have, cells which have two sets of chromosome, chromosomes, they are diploid. For example, in case of human, humans, 
we have two sets of 23 chromosome, 46 chromosomes. 46 chromosome. So, so this is a when you, when a cell has two sets of similar chromosome, two sets of 23 chromosomes in, in humans, it is diploid. Now in germ cells, in germ cells, when the gametes undergo meiosis, in the, in the germ cells, when the gametes undergo uh, meiosis, these um, germ cells, when they go meiosis in, to form gametes, there is, there is reduction of chromosomal numbers by half. So chromosomes num numbers are reduced by half. So the 46 chromosomes in human becomes 23. So what happens? 23 chromosome, 23 from father. And when, and come, you know, interacts with 23 chromosomes from mother, they end up, for, if the fertilization is successful, they lead to the formation of zygote, which is again back to 46 chromosome. So a diploid is two, set, two sets of chromosome. In case of humans, all those cells that have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosome, they are diploid. And <clears throat> germ cells that give rise to gametes, formation of gametes is dependent upon meiosis, and in gametes, there is reduction of chromosomal number by half due to meiosis. So that's a different difference between an haploid cell and diploid cells. So a hair follicle or a skin cell is a diploid cell. It has 46 chromosomes. But gametes, whether it's sperms on, in male or eggs in female, they have undergone meiosis, so they are haploid cells. Okay. Now, what are the salient features of, so let me um, go to the slides to show you the salient features. So these are the salient feature of various phases of meiosis. So in interface cells, the chromosomes, remember I told you six categories in which you can uh, study uh, mitosis, chromosomal structure, chromosomal movement, spindle fibers, uh, presence or absence of nucleus, nucleolus. So in, in prophase, the chromosome is very thin. Sorry, I apologize. In interphase, the chromosome is very thin. And at this point of time, two things could happen. Either the cells are not going to divide or they're preparing for mitotic division or cell division. So regardless, the nucleus is well formed the chromosomes are thin like woolen ball. And in here, you see a structure within the nucleus called as nucleolus. And pay attention to these centrioles, a pair of centrioles. They are very much localized. They are very much stationary. As the cell decides to enter, so let's say in the skin cell, there is an injury. There's a cut and the cells wants to heal the cut, heal the wound. So the cells can only divide to heal the wound. So an interphase cell would enter into prophase. And in prophase, you can look very carefully. Uh, the centrioles, they start moving in opposite direction, right? And when they're moving, they're releasing some raised kind of structure. These raised-like structures are called as spindle fibers. We'll see what it does. And look at that closely, the nucleus. This nucleus, it has lost its, it has lost, uh, lost its, its, its nucleolus. The chromosome, which was thin in interface, now it has become very thick. It is how it becomes thick by shortening of chromosomes. So if you take a string in your hand and you keep 
knotting it up, the size of this, the string or rope will be shortening. That's, you know, that's pretty much what happens to the, to the shortening of chromosome. The chromosome becomes, chromosomes doesn't shorten in length, be very careful. Chromosomes, they get condensed. And that's because of packaging and super packaging and super, super packaging. So thin becomes you know, condensed and they appear to be short. A typical chromosomes you will start seeing in, in prometaphase. What do I mean by typical? So there is a cent central piece called as central um, centrosome. And it is connected to the chromatids. Now in prometaphase, in, 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 uh, in prometaphase, these spindle fibers, they go and, they go and, so let me go to this slide. So in prometaphase, you, you see here, this is called as centromere, the central piece. Centro, centromere is the place where spindle fibers go and attach itself. And what helps in attaching the spindle fibers to centromeres is called as kinetochore. So here, so if the question comes, in which phase spindles, in which phase of mitosis does spindle fibers attaches to the, to the uh, <clears throat> centromere? The answer is, Prometaphase. And how it attaches? It att attaches through an aperture called as kinetochore. So you, if, you, if you see in, in together and you focus on the length of the chromosomes, from going from interphase to prophase to prometaphase, the chromosomal size have condensed. And that's because of superpackaging. Nucleus has almost disappeared, it's fragmented. Nucleolus is already not there. And this these two, these a pair of centrioles, now they have become polar. Polar means you can describe it as North Pole and South Pole. So this is the central feature of prophase. Um, and then what happens in metaphase? All the chromosomes, they arrange. So look at the beauty of nature. That all the chromosomes are arranged in one line. So 46 chromosomes in our body, in our dividing cells, they arrange in one line, in one, one cube. So let's say if people are standing oppositely, it's difficult to organize. But if they're, if they're, if they're symmetrical, they're, arranged, they're in a line, it is, it, is, it is easy to manage. Let's say if you're entering a place or entering a building. So chromosomes, they become aligned on this plate. Since this is in the center of a cell, this is also called as equatorial plate. Now, books are mentioning this as a metaphased plate or metaphasic plate. So if the question comes in which phase of this mitosis does the, uh, do the chromosomes arrange themselves in, uh, on the center of a cell uh, or a metaphasic plate or a metaphased plate is formed, that phase is called as metaphase. Now the reason this arrangement happens, this, this disciplinary, this disciplined arrangement occurs is only to, to facilitate splitting of chromosomes. Splitting of chromosomes into, into daughter chromosomes. Now this is also a juncture where students get confused. So let me just go back to the concept slides. So look here. Yeah, so this is the chromosome by itself. If there is a need for a cell to replicate because there is a scar, there is a wound, there's a wound to heal, there's a small micro injury to the tissue or to the skin cells, the cells need to divide. So the, before, the cells, before the cells divide, the chromosomes have to duplicate, rep, DNA has to replicate so that each daughter cells get equal amount of DNA, right? So what's the use of mitosis? What's the significance of what is the functional importance of mitosis? Is that the daughter cells get equal amount of chromosomes, DNA, equal amount of mitochondria, equal amount of Golgi, endoplasmic reticulum, 
um, so and so forth. So equal division. That's the beauty of mitosis. So the, the chromosome divides from single chromosome to, to this chromosome as double sister chromatids. So this is a chromosome with one chromatid and this is with two chromatids. How it happens? It's because of duplication. And then in anaphase, this divides. In anaphase divides to form two independent daughter chromosomes. So this is what is happening in this figure. Can you see this colored slide, please? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. So here in anaphase, the, chrom daughter, the chromosomes, they disintegrate or they divide. And how they divide? So what we think these thin spindle fibers are, actually they're very powerful. And they're so powerful that they can split the chromosome into two daughter cells. And when these two daughter cells are, two daughter, I'm sorry, two, two chrom, uh, single chromosome is split into two daughter chromosomes, they start moving towards opposite poles. So I repeat, uh, in anaphase, which, is, which, is, which follows metaphase, the chromosomes split into daughter chromosomes. And these daughter chromosomes starts moving towards uh, opposite ends towards North Pole and South Pole. And this is facilitated by, a, by spindle fibers. So spindle fibers are really motor engines. They're very muscular. They're very, very energetic because breaking is chromosomes, 46 chromosomes. And if there is any lack of, of timing, then cells will receive unequal number of chromosomes and that can give rise to disease such as cancer. So this division of chromosome is very, very critical for any cell, normal cell to survive. If, if, if it is not well-timed, it is not orchestrated well, then it can, it's a potential point to give rise to various kinds of problems. But if things are normal, then, then chromosomes have divided. And now that's the whole purpose of, of mitosis to divide the chromosomes so that each daughter nuclei gets equal number of chromosomes. So in telophase, telophase, the daughters, they, got, they get equal number of chromosomes. The nucleus start for, uh, forming. So whatever the cell lost, the cell, cell, cell lost uh, uh, during prophase, it gains back during telophase. So the nucleus is formed, it begins to form, nucleolus begins, nucleolus begins to appear. Now chromosomes have divided, the spindle fibers, they have receded. There's no need because, so if the cell doesn't need spindle fibers, so it is back. And again, these centrioles are, are stationary, they don't, this not needed. It is almost cells are, cells are, a cell is very close to dividing. So once, the chromosomes have divided, nucleus have formed, the cytosol has to divide. And division of cytosol is called as cytokinesis. So mitosis can be karyokinesis, which, is, which involves division of, equal division of chromosomal number into daughter nuclei and formation of two independent daughter nuclei. That's the so division of nucleus or formation of two daughter nuclei is called as karyokinesis. Division of cytoplasm that would give rise to two independent cell, cells is called as cytokinesis. So let's see at what question we are. What question number we are? So we talked about haploid cells. So we talked about um, we talked about uh, two to three sentences explain the salient features of all the phases. So I talked about that you look this. So when you study mitosis as a paragraph, as a page, you get confused. But if you organize it into, if, you, if you're studying in a very organized way, especially if you're applying for medical school or any uh, para health programs, you need mitosis and meiosis are very important. 
and uh, you learn at every stage. So the best way that I advise students to study mitosis or meiosis is to study under these topics. Uh, number one, uh, chromosomal, chromosomal structure, then uh, movement of chromosomes, then um, a nucleus, presence or absence of nucleus, and and nucleolus and spindle fibers. Uh, fourth is spindle fibers, and uh, last one is centrioles or centrosomes. Movement of centrioles. So if you study these um, mito these phases under these subheadings you will understand more what is happening rather than just reading like a paragraph. Most books will give as a paragraph and it will show the picture, but I always suggest to students to learn, learn or, so it's easy. If you make a chart like this, it's, it's before the exam, you just need to review for five minutes. But if you have to read the whole chapter of mitosis, it will be very time taking. So that's one of the approach to study um, science to make it very objective. So that's what I meant when I asked you. Now, uh, question number 14 is, what is the difference between karyokinesis and cytokinesis? So as I mentioned before, karyokinesis is division of one nucle nucleus into two daughter nuclei. And cytokinesis is, is division of one cytoplasm into two daughter uh, cells. Um, so uh, many uh, books would say or make, confuse, uh, make the students confused whether cytokinesis is part of mitosis, yes or no? No, cytokinesis is not part of mitosis. Mitosis is just division of chromosomes and nucleus. So uh, mitosis finishes and cytokinesis starts. Many book will not distinguish. Maybe in future when the technology develops, it could be part of mitosis, but no. There are two different processes, karyokinesis or mitosis and cytokinesis, they are two independent processes. Now question number 15, uh, what are the differences between mitosis and meiosis? So I think I have, I, I mentioned in, in a different ways, I have come and I have spoken about mitosis and meiosis. So mitosis, is a, it maintains maintains the number of chromosomes. It maintains the number of chromosomes, mitosis. And then it occurs in somatic cells, cells which don't form. Um, it's not in game, the process of, it's not, mitosis is not part of gamete formation. So it's it and it mainly mitosis leads to growth, growth, um, development, differentiation, differentiation. It's a result of, as I mentioned to you, zygote we develop into an individual. That's because of mitosis. So this is the three most important points. Uh, meiosis, Me, um, meiosis is meiosis mainly occurs in germ cells. Um, the chromosomal chromosomal number is, is reduced by half and it leads to gamete formation. One very important thing that you can, you can say is that mitotic division leads to the formation of two daughter cells, mitosis 
leads to formation of two daughter cells, whereas, uh, whereas uh, meiosis leads to the formation of four daughter cells. So two versus four. So these are the main chief differences between mitosis and meiosis. What's the next question? Yeah, so remember I just, I went through, so this table, it helps to you to review quickly the stages of mitosis in terms of chromosomal structure, chromosome movement, centrioles. So all you need to do is that chromosomes, so for example, chromosomal structure is thin here in interphase. In, prof in prophase, the chromosome becomes condensed, condensed. And in, in chromatophase, it is uh, typical uh, chromosomes. Uh, same here in telophase, again, the chromosome becomes thin. So this way I want you to fill them. So I talked about what is the difference between mitosis and meiosis. Now, uh, me, uh, me, Mitosis is a one phase division. What I mean here, sorry, mitosis is a one phase react, one phase division. Mitosis occurs in one phase. This one phase is made up of prophase, prometaphase, uh, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis. So mainly one, but meiosis, meiosis, meiosis has two phases, two phases. What are these phases? One and two. So out of these two phases, uh, meiosis one, M1, is reduction division, reduction. The chromosome number reduces. In M2, the chromosome number is, the chromosomal numbers, chromosomal um, numbers are maintained. So meiosis two is more like mitosis. I don't want to go into detail, but just to give you Meiosis one, so meiosis overall is a reduction division, right? Where does reduction occurs? Meiosis one or meiosis two? So reduction occurs in meiosis one. What happens in meiosis two? The cells or the chromosome duplicates. So I will not go into the details of meiosis, but I will come back to meiosis as we go into more questions. So here, the next question, how many daughter cells are formed at the end of meiosis one and meiosis two? So remember in mitosis, I mentioned to you, only two daughter cells are formed. Whereas in meiosis, whereas in meiosis one, in M1, M1 leads to the formation of two cells. And then these two cells enters the M2 phase and then that leads to the formation of four cells. Okay. Now, what are these M1 and M2 phase, M2 phases? So uh, meiosis one is made up of prophase one, prometaphase one, metaphase one, Anaphase one, telophase one, and cytokinesis one. This is meiosis one. So a cell that enters the meiosis one at the end of meiosis one forms two daughter cells. Daughter cells, daughter cell one, and daughter cell two. So this, this cell, 
the cell at the end of meiosis one forms two daughter cells and these two daughter cells have undergone reduction reduction in chromosomes by right these cells these two cells now these two 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 cells these two cells now enters into another div another division so other another division called as meiosis meiosis 2 and this meiosis 2 is made up of prophase 2 uh, pro metaphase 2 metaphase 2 anaphase 2 telophase 2 and then cytokinesis 2 so at the end these two cells enter into uh, meiosis 2 and then they form four cells four cells four cells so what happens in meiosis 2 only the chromosome duplicates the it's not reduced reduction occurs in meiosis 1 so let's just quickly look into the mechanism i'm not going into the details so figure uh, so uh, so here what happens uh, one of the uh, what happens that in meiosis 1 the chromosomes they are reduced and then in meiosis 2 the reduced chromosomes are are equally divided into four chromosomes and each daughter cell receives one chromosome so uh, i won't go into detail of you know exact uh, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 but let's touch a little bit more detail at what stage of meiosis crossing over occurs so crossing over what is the basis for cro crossing over first it occurs in prophase one so the variation that we see all over the globe or in a one family so you have to think that the two parents are similar but if there are multiple siblings each each kid is different from other and that's because of crossing over crossing over is nothing but exchange of genetic elements exchange of exchange of genetic elements it occurs in prophase one so the mother and parent chromosome let's say the shake the chain the exchange the handshake and the, during this handshake the mother and the father chromosome they exchange the chromosomal parts and because of that the genetic variation comes in the next generation so crossing over is nothing but exchange of genetic uh, elements that is chromosome that is dna and it occurs in prophase one what is homologous pairing uh, so what is the result of crossing over question number 22nd the result of Crossing over is to generate variation. Otherwise, let's say the human human being came on this planet millions of years ago. Till today, everyone would have looked similar. It's because of crossing over that there is variation, there is diversity. What is homologous pairing? So homologous pairing is when two identical chromosomes, when two identical chromosomes, they pair. So let's say chromosome number one from father and chromosome number one from mom, when they pair with each other, it is called as homologous pairing. If the pairing occurs between chromosome number one and chromosome number two, then it is not homologous pairing. It is non-homologous pairing. So I repeat again, homologous pairing means 
same chromosomes. Chromosome number one pairs with chromosome number one. It is called as homologous pairing. Where does this a pair of chromosome comes from? One comes from dad and one comes from mom. And this homologous pairing facilitates the process of crossing over. So uh, between meiosis and meiosis two, which one is responsible for reduction of division? Division. I already mentioned to you that it is meiosis one, which is reductional division. Division uh, between meiosis one and two, which looks like mitosis. It is meiosis two, which looks like mitosis because the chromosomal number is maintained. Twenty-sixth. What are the differences between prophase one and prophase two? Anaphase one and anaphase two. So the biggest or uh, the significant difference between prophase one and and prophase two is is the happening of crossing over. And this crossing over occurs in meiosis one. So this is the major difference between prophase one and prophase two. What is the difference between uh, Anaphase one and anaphase two. The difference is that in anaphase one, in anaphase one, daughter, daughter chromosomes, splits. Daughter chromosomes splits in anaphase one. In anaphase two. Homologous chromosomes, homologous hom homologous chromosomes. I repeat, in anaphase one, daughter daughter chromosome splits in mitosis. In anaphase uh, two. Uh, so I, 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 just, I just want to go back to the question for exact. So what is the difference between anaphase one and anaphase two? So in anaphase one, uh, this is the reverse. In anaphase one, homologous chromosome split. In anaphase two, the daughter chromosome splits. So as a result of anaphase one, homologous chromosome splits. The, the chromosomal number is reduced. It's because of anaphase one that the chromosomal numbers are reduced. And anaphase two, it is daughter chromosome splits and which is like mitosis. What are the last few questions? What are the end products of cytokinesis one and cytokinesis two? So cytokinesis one give rise to two daughter cells, regardless of mitosis or meiosis. Uh, so let me repeat this question. What are the ends of cytokinesis one and cytokinesis two? So cytokinesis is division of cytoplasm. Cytokinesis one occurs at the end of meiosis one. And this give rise to two daughter cells with reduced number of chromosomes. In cytokinesis two, it happens as a part of meiosis, as, as after meiosis two, and this cytokinesis two give rise to two daughter cells. From two daughter cells, cytokinesis two give rise to four daughter cells. So, uh, and the last question is, is that it's the, just the review of meiosis one and meiosis two. So whatever I have spoken until now, this last question is just the review of, of all the process, all the phases of meiosis one and meiosis two. So um, now I open the class to the, to uh, questions and answers question and answering session. Hi, Professor. Uh, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. 
So for the very last uh, question, uh, you say, uh, draw the individual stages of meiosis one and meiosis two, comparing the stages of uh, prophase one and two, chromatophase one and two, and so on and so forth. So does that mean we have to write anything for that? Um, no, just draw. Just draw them, okay. So, there is, uh, so if you go to my lecture slides, I think last three slides, they do that. Okay, so just draw it, okay, no problem. 